When we look at Europe's past, we see a history of deception, darkness, conquest, tyranny, carnage, oppression, feudalism, fascism, Nazism, socialism, and communism. And, and many of these isms actually came out of Europe, out of Europe, Europe and its universities. Who would have thought that such genocide and barbarity would come out of the Holocaust? After all, Europe, and especially Germany, they had some of the finest universities. They had some of the finest cultural institutions literature, music, the arts. They were a civilized people. Do you see how the heart is wicked, as the Bible says? That's why we have to guard our hearts, for they are the wellspring of life. And so we saw these atrocities come from a nation and a continent where we would least expect them. But when we look at Europe's history, if we look at the wars of Europe, that's excluding Russia and the Balkans. There were over since 500, about 500 BC to the present war in the Ukraine. There have been over 100 wars fought on European soil. The Hundred Years' Wars was a major war, and in fact it took 116 years. It was for the control of the throne of France between England and France. It took 2.3 to 3.3 million lives slaughtered. The German Peasants' War in the 1500s was an uprising of German peasants against the oppressive and abusive feudalistic system in Germany at that time. We call the Middle Ages the Dark Ages and I don't think it's a coincidence that in those times, the Bible was out of the hands of the common man. They, did, they weren't able to study the scriptures. I don't think it, it is a coincidence that we call these days the Dark Ages. And so we see that the peasants wanted to establish Christian ideals in their government. What's interesting is that in this emerging new world order that we're seeing, it's going to take the form of a feudalistic system where there's a privileged elite, a privileged elite of overlords and poor vassals who own nothing and serve the ruling class. And so what's interesting is that this same feudalistic spirit, and once again, we're looking at spiritual things here, what underlies this material realm are spiritual forces and spiritual realities, and Jesus talks about them in Scripture. We cannot ignore them. They shouldn't frighten us. They're just a reality. Jesus has given us victory over these dark forces and over evil and over Satan. He's a defeated foe. We, we must not fear him. But this is how the world is operating. And the world system, the cosmos as we know it, this world system is not a work of the Holy Spirit. This world system is a work of the evil one. And that's why it's exploitive. That's why it is unjust. That's why it is violent and barbarous, barbarous and oppressive. Do you see that? It's not the work of the Holy Spirit. And so these peasants, that's all they wanted to do. They wanted to establish Christian ideals in government. That same spirit of, that was behind feudalism in the 1500s is that same spirit that is operating today. The same spirit that was trying to withhold the answered prayers to Daniel in Persia, the prince of, through the prince of Persia, that powerful demonic entity resisting Daniel's prayers is still at work today in the area that we call Iran. And so these are very powerful evil forces that are trying to resist God, his people, and his will in the world. But the victory is the Lord's, okay? We must not think that these powers are greater than God. These are created entities. And so we must never ever fear that, okay? So the peasant rebellion was crushed by Germany's rulers and between 100 and 200,000 people were killed. 
The Eighty Years' War in the 1500s and early 1600s was a Dutch War of Independence, and that war was predominantly between Protestants of the Netherlands and Catholics of Spain. And unfortunately, one million people perished in that religious war. The French Wars of Religion were between the Protestant French Huguenots and the Roman Catholics. It was a Protestant and Catholic religious war from 1562 to 1629. This war was brutal. There were many atrocities and broken treaties. It was vicious. It was barbarous. And between two and four million people were killed. This is the history of Europe. But that was not the end. In the early part of the 20th, the 20th century, we find World War I where there were 40 million casualties, military and civilian. 40 million people perished in World War I. And once again, we get another world war coming out of Europe. Do we expect anything else in the future? Really. World War II, at least 70 million people perished. And that was people who died directly from, war, from the war itself or war-related famine or diseases. 70 million people. Our enemies will take advantage of our weakness. And the only way that international peace is going to come is if we are strong. The defenders of freedom are strong. We are strong morally. We are strong spiritually. We are strong economically. We have the right values, godly values, and we are strong militarily. And that is what made America a great nation because America was dedicated to our Lord Jesus Christ. And our founders, though imperfect men, the documents that gave us our democratic republic were based on scripture and biblical truth. And so the tragedy is Europe became a power in the world. And Western civilization arose out of Europe because they had the gospel. They had the word of God. They had biblical morals, values, and standards of conduct. And now Europe is godless. They have rejected the Lord. Our nation is rejecting the Lord. We're turning away from God. We're turning away from the precious Holy Scriptures. And there will be consequences. And that's what we're, we're experiencing and seeing at this time in history. The Lord warns his people in Israel. And in Deuteronomy 6, he said, when you eat and are satisfied, he was giving them a land that was filled with milk and honey. It was a, it was a fertile land. It was a prosperous land. It was a rich land. And he says, when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord. Deuteronomy 6, 12. The Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of a land of slavery. Generations hence, we see in the book of Hosea. Hosea 13, 4. But I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall acknowledge no God but me, no Savior except me. I cared for you in the desert, in the land of burning heat, when I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. You see, when they, when they become proud, they take God for granted. They no longer acknowledge that these blessings are from God. They have a sense of entitlement. And they no longer are grateful. And that's what happened to Israel. I've, when I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. Now, there's nothing wrong with being prosperous. Prosperity is a blessing in the hands of God's people to help others in need. Do you see that? It's forgetting God that is the problem. And he says, so the Lord himself said he will come against them. 
He says, you are destroyed, O Israel, because you are against me, against your helper. Because they became proud, they forgot him, they didn't acknowledge his help in the nation. And so he gave them over in their idolatry, by the way. They slipped into idolatry, into serving foreign gods. And in their idolatry, in betraying their Lord, the Lord allowed their enemies to overrun them. And we saw Assyria and we saw Babylon overrun the northern tribes of Israel and Judah. And that was their history. The captivity cured them of idolatry. It was a difficult time, but it cured them of idolatry. America has followed the same paths and steps of past superpowers that have fallen. We became strong militarily, as they did, and then we become strong economically. We spread our influence around the world. Prosperity then leads them into pride, overconfidence, comfort, ease, complacency, leisure, and laziness, and that's what's happened to our nation. And I think that's why the church needs to pray at this time. Such nations grow quickly, they grow soft, they grow weak, and they grow ineffective. But we have God's people in this nation, praying for this nation. If God was going to save, would be willing to save Sodom for 10 righteous people, how much more will God save America for the millions of righteous and prayerful born-again believers in this nation? Do you see that? So we can't write this nation off. It's a terrible thing to write this nation off because there are no hopeless causes for God's people. If we earnestly pray and seek his face and be the light and be the salt and be a blessing wherever we are and share the good news and walk with a countenance that, that speaks of and confirms that we are children of God, that we have a blessed hope as his people, to walk with hope, to walk with peace, to walk with joy, because we are a people who are separated unto God. That's who we are. Isn't that a blessing? And the, and the world needs to see this because they see enough despair. They see enough hopelessness. But we bring the light and the hope of Jesus Christ to the world. This is why you are here today in this nation, raised up. And I believe every appointment is a divine appointment. I believe we're here in this congregation for a divine purpose. Because the word of God is going to speak to each and every one of you in a very specific way. To speak to your heart, it, 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 it will correct us, it will inspire us, it will empower us, it will strengthen us, it will embolden us, and it will give us hope. Do you see that? And so we're here for a purpose today. You're members of his kingdom. If you don't know Jesus, give your heart to Jesus. Surrender your heart and your life to Jesus. And let him lead you and guide you. He's a loving and a gracious Lord. And so what happens to these nations? Proverbs 29 18 in the New American Standard, where there is no vision, or in other words, revelation. The revelation is the word of God. If you don't have the word of God, the people are unrestrained. They cast off restraint or they are perish. That's what the scriptures say in these various translations. So where there's no vision or revelation, the people are unrestrained and they perish. And so we, what do we see with these superpowers that begin to implode? Extravagant public spending. We saw that with Roman empire, emperors. They built these monuments to their egos they spent public money recklessly. They were opulent. They spent taxpayer money. They debased their currency by introducing lesser metals like copper into their silver coins. Their currency being debased, excessive spending, and now they have hyperinflation. And so they increased the tax burden on the people, put a burden on the people, especially the working class, and it results in a marked economic decline, lower standards of living. Also, what accompanies this whole process is a lowering of the moral content of the culture. They will elevate intellectualism. They'll pursue worldly knowledge and wisdom and they'll take pride in it. They'll pursue human ph philosophies over the knowledge of God. They become prideful in their vain imaginings and in their musings 
they are carried away. Paul says, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And that's what we see in our nation and in the West. Our leaders have become fools. They've turned away from the living God and their thinking has become futile. The nations of the West have rejected, mocked, and insulted God and his holy scriptures. What we have sown we shall reap. You see, God has a role for you throughout all of this. God is blessing his people and our role is to approach this mess with the power of the Holy Spirit, with the power of the word of God, in humility, in trust of God, with great courage and boldness to speak the truth in love and to be witnesses for Jesus. That is the saving grace of our nation, is that God has his people here who carry his presence, who speak his word of truth and are bringing salvation to those who are living in hopelessness, despair, and darkness. Amen? This results in these superpowers, in these great nations, in a very rapid decline, owing to moral decadence, promiscuity, perversion, greed, graft, and corruption. Corruption is where public officials dip their fingers into the national treasury to enrich themselves on the backs of taxpayers. It results in a lack of personal responsibility and integrity and character. These vices have become pervasive in every level of our society, in every level of our government, our commerce, and our culture. Enemies will perceive when a nation is in decline. And what you're seeing right now with aggressive moves by North Korea, by aggressive moves by China, by aggressive moves by Russia, you see they sense their perception and the perception is a reality. If you give the perception of being weak, they see you as weak. They see blood in the water and they're ready to attack. And they will become bolder and bolder and bolder until we show some backbone. You see, our politicians have a lot of wishbone, but they don't have backbone. We need backbone, not wishbone. A lot of people wishing for so many different things and talking a good talk, but we need to put action behind our words. And we as Christians must walk the talk too. Amen? Because then God will back us with the power of heaven. And we need the power of heaven in our nation right now. Because we've turned away from it. And if they've turned away from it, we have the power of heaven. And we can make a difference in this nation. And I don't say that pridefully. I say that matter-of-factly. Amen? And so the enemies see this, and they plot, and they exploit the vulnerabilities of a nation that is in decline. And great nations in decline are like a steel structure that is corroding from within. On the outside, it looks strong, it looks stable, it looks intact, but in a moment, it can come down. And that's usually what happens with these empires. They implode. And it's not so much their enemies. Remember Babylon and Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. He was partying. He was having a good time. And the enemy, Persians, were at the gate. They actually dug under the walls and they took the city without, without any difficulty whatsoever. In fact, the Babylonians were so disgusted with the dissolute and the ineffective king that they had, that they virtually welcomed the Persians. Isn't that tragic? It's tragic to see nations fall. But you know something? God allows nations to rise and God will take nations down and cause them to fall if they are wicked and turn against him. Amen? Unbelievable. I want to read to you a powerful psalm. Please listen to this. I won't be able to get to the entire message, which is really 
quite illuminating. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 1, I'm reading out of the New Living. Why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The Lord asks. The kings, or that is the nation's leaders, he's saying. The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord. And that's what's happening right now. The leaders of the EU, the leaders of America, and other nations are plotting against the Lord. They want to wipe the name of the Lord out of their cultures. They plot against the Lord and against his anointed one. That means Messiah. It's referring to Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Thousands of years ago, this was written, speaking of today, the day in which you live. Verse 3, let us break their chains, these leaders say. They cry. Let us break their chains and free ourselves from slavery to God. You talk about being warped. You talk about nations that are going to be judged. Do you think God is going to avert his eyes when he sees this and he hears this blasphemy? He's going to judge the nations. Do you see that? Verse 4, but the one who rules in heaven, that is God, laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then in anger, he, that is God, rebukes them. He rebukes the enemies of God, terrifying them with his fierce fury. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem on my holy mountain. He's speaking of Jesus, Messiah. And Jesus, the Messiah here, says in verse 7, The Lord said to me, his father says to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Only ask and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the whole earth as your possession. You will break them with an iron rod and smash them like pots. Revelation tells us that this last empire coming out of Europe, headed by the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the evil one, that that is going to be broken and shattered by a rock that comes from heaven. And that rock that comes from heaven will destroy that empire. And that rock is the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Can you believe that? It's going to happen. Everything that has been predicted concerning the nations in Scripture has come to pass. There's no reason to believe that what has gone unfulfilled will not take place. Amen? And so he says here, Now then, you kings, act wisely. They have just plotted against God and against his Messiah, Jesus Christ. Okay? They are enemies of God. They've shown themselves to be enemies of God. But the Lord says to the kings, act wisely. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverent fear and rejoice with trembling. See, God is so gracious that he calls them to repentance. He gives them an opportunity to repent. Isn't God gracious and faithful? He cares about them. He desires that none should perish. And so he gives an opportunity to wicked kings who hate him. That's why there are people in America who hate God. God can turn their hearts. Circumstances can turn their hearts. A word the Lord can speak through you can turn and melt, dissolve their hardened hearts against the Lord God. Are you seeing this? In a moment... And to me, that is greater than any physical miracle that anyone can see. I don't care if a hand or a foot is restored, if an eye is restored. There is no greater miracle than a heart that has been hardened, that dissolves and surrenders and yields to Jesus in brokenness, contriteness, and humility. That's a miracle. You've just witnessed the greatest miracle because it leads to eternal life. I may have parts of my body healed that need healing, but this body is physical and it is perishable. But a heart that changes and turns to Jesus is now, the Bible says, joined with Jesus, Paul says. And that means that person lives forever in the presence of God. Is that not powerful? That's why 
it's the greater miracle. But we emphasize physical miracles. They're good. People need them. But let, not, let, let us not neglect the most glorious and wonderful miracles, eternal life. I want to share with you this story. God has Christians act in ways that the world does not understand. I'll give you a case in point. There are centuries ago, this is a story about what happened, what actually happened centuries ago. Centuries ago, an old man made a dangerous journey through the forests of his native Poland. On the way, he encountered a band of robbers who demanded all of his belongings. The thieves finally asked this old man, have you given us everything? When he answered everything, they let the old man go. When they had left the old man, he touched something in the hem of his robe. It was his gold sewn there for safety. He had forgotten about it in the midst of the trauma, the trauma of being robbed. At once, and this is amazing, at once, the old man hurried back to find the robbers. Having found him, having found the robbers, he said, what I told you was not true. It was not intentional. I was too terrified to think. Here, take the gold in my robes. Then to the old man's utter astonishment, None of the robbers offered to take his gold. You talk about the conviction of the Holy Spirit in a man's heart. Even hardened criminals have a, have an, a propensity and an opportunity to get right with God and to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's convicting power. All of a sudden, one of the thieves went and brought back the old man's purse. Another restored his prayer book, and still another led his horse toward him and helped him mount his horse. Then all of the robbers earnestly sought their victim's blessing and watched him slowly ride away. Good has overcome evil. You want to destroy evil. You destroy evil and the works of the evil one by doing good, by returning evil with good. And by depending on the Holy Spirit, and we're all challenged in this, there are so many things that could set us off and cause us to lose our witness for Christ, to get us upset, to get us angry, to get us frustrated. I've had opportunities like that last week. But I depend on the grace and the mercy and the power of God to keep me right before him, that I will not be a bad witness. Lord, please, I do not want to be a bad or a poor witness for Jesus. I want to honor you and glorify you by the way I live, by the way I conduct myself, by my attitude of hope and joy in you and expectation and gratitude for the good things you've done in my life. And I want that to emanate from my life. I want to be incandescent with the glory of God in my life because he resides in me. Shall we stand? Do you see why the world sees the things of God and the ways of God as foolish? The ways of God are counterintuitive to the world. But it's the world who is foolish. Their wisdom is foolishness. It's nonsense. It achieves nothing of any eternal value. But the wisdom of God is everlasting. The wisdom of God and faithfulness to God will bring the will of God in and through your life. 
And when you do the will of God, you will see people change. You can see nations change. That second world war, that could have been easily lost. But there were men and women broken before God on their knees, hour after hour after hour, praying and fasting. They were doing the real battling. The real battle is on your knees. Moses was doing the real battling. Joshua was fighting the Amalekites in the desert. But Moses was on the mountaintop, raising his hands, looking to heaven and trusting that the battle is the Lord's. You keep on praising God through your battles. You keep on looking and fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Because in the midst of the battle, you need an infusion of the faith of Jesus. And he'll give it to you. Because he knows that in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. Shall we meditate on this? Let these words seep deeply into your heart saturate your soul and encourage you and strengthen you. That God has called you to great things because you serve a great God and a great God does great and mighty things. There's no mediocrity in the kingdom of heaven.